Okay, brothers and sisters, I'm back again with a continuation of reading. So this is what it's saying. You are seated with me, so I want you to begin thinking like you are seated with me. Ephesians 2, 6. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Lord Jesus says, You are seated with me, so I want you to begin thinking like you are seated with me, to begin praying like you are seated with me, to begin speaking like you are seated with me. In the Old Testament, my people were servants who were citizens of earth. In the New Testament, my people are my children who are citizens of heaven. Because you are used to thinking of yourselves as earthly citizens, you introduce into your prayers a sense of distance every time you pray. There is no distance between us. I want you to meditate on the truth that you are seated with me, that you are seated in heaven with me, because you are one spirit with me. When you renew your mind to this truth, it will cause your prayer life and fellowship with me to go to dimensions you never thought possible. When you change how you view where you are seated, you will find it very easy to believe for mighty miracles. You will find it very easy to be in constant communion with me all day long. You will walk with my Father exactly as I walked with my father, and minister exactly as I ministered. For on the cross, I took upon myself everything you were, everything that you had, so that you could have everything that I have. God's Definition of Grace The Father says, you have heard grace defined as God's unmerited favor. Have you noticed that this definition mentions neither Jesus nor the cross? That's because that definition did not come from me. This is man's definition of grace. Here is mine. I treat you with the favor Jesus deserves. He received what you deserved on the cross. You believe on him. I placed you in him, and now I treat you like him. That is my definition of grace. Comment he gave to add. So when we are born again, the Father sees us as he sees Jesus, because we are now in Christ. The Father's love is always directed toward Jesus, so his love is always directed toward us. The Father's face always shines on Jesus, and therefore his face always shines on us. We hold the same place in the Father's heart that Jesus does. John 17 verse 23 We have complete access to the Father just like Jesus does. All of his wisdom, his strength, his love, his joy. So we are included in the relationship between the Father and Jesus. And due to that unimaginable level of intimacy that we now have with the Father, we just have to ask and unimaginable strength to walk victoriously is put at our disposal. That is how the Father sees grace. The most blessed place to be in the universe is in my presence. The Father says, You were seated with my Son Jesus in heavenly realms when you believed. Ephesians 2.6 You are sitting in the most blessed place to sit in all of creation. Though you cannot see me clearly, yet, with the eyes of your heart, you are sitting unbelievably close to me. 
You catch glimpses of how close you are to me from time to time in your prayers and worship times. Soon you will be aware of me much more than you ever thought possible. Soon you will be able to see my face with the eyes of your heart nearly as clearly as those in heaven see me. The eyes of your heart are about to be flooded with a full understanding of who you are. You are about to see just how perfectly the cross restored you to me. You will walk aware of heaven just as my son Jesus walked aware of heaven. You will do what you see me doing and say what you hear me saying just as Jesus did. You will walk before me and minister just exactly as Jesus did and walk in the miraculous in a scale never seen on this earth. My son Jesus will see this and rejoice. Then I will send him to bring his victorious bride home. The law of sowing and reaping is a spiritual principle. The law of sowing and reaping is a spiritual principle. It does not only apply to man. For example, the father sowed a son so that he could reap many sons. The enemy has been spending years sowing terror, fear, confusion, and dismay among God's people. In this season, he is about to reap terror, fear, confusion, and dismay at the hands of God's people, because they will know who they are. So those the enemy oppressed will be used to oppress the enemy. Those who the enemy made shed tears will be used to cause crying in the enemy camp. This is the season things are made right. How to Grow in Revelation Knowledge 2 Corinthians 4.6 says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Ephesians 1.17 and 18 In the Amplified, says Paul, prayed for the Ephesians, Ephesians church that the eyes of their hearts be flooded with light. We see in the Psalms where it says, In your light we see light. Revelation is reading the word through his eyes. His eyes are the word. It says all things are laid bare by his word. The Bible is not an ordinary book or even just a holy book. It is light from the heavenly realm in written form. As you speak his word, you speak light into yourself. Each time you speak his word is a let there be light moment in your spirit. So the more light in your spirit, the more you can see. When you spoke his word to get saved, was the first let there be light moment? For that is when his son, who is his light came to live within you. Then his spirit hovered over you, and there became a new creation in your inner man. So he means for us to grow in revelation knowledge, the same way that we first got saved, by speaking his light into ourselves. His spirit then takes that light and shows our minds things he wants us to see like new things in his word, or things in the spirit which is called discerning of spirits, or wisdom on a matter which is called word of wisdom, etc. That is how you grow in revelation knowledge. The Bible is the light from the face of Jesus in written form. As you say his word, that light fills your heart and transforms your face to look like his face more and more. That process is called going from glory to glory. The more light within your heart, the more his spirit can transform you into his image. So your face will look more and more like his face. The Lord wants 
to show you something about how revelation works. Revelation example one. He sees you as being so righteous that you are now inside of God. Colossians 3.3 3 says, For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Think about what that really means. Under the old covenant, the Lord had to hide Moses in the cleft of a rock and only allowed Moses to see his back after he had walked past. In the new covenant, we are inside of the one who walked past Moses. That is how righteous he sees us. Notice how in the above revelation there is a connection between the section of scripture where Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory, Exodus 33:18 and Philippians 3:20, where we as believers are now hidden with Christ in God. Revelation example 2. Jesus came that we might have life and that more abundantly. Life and that more abundantly is life as it is in heaven. Notice that there is also a connection between two scriptures. The scripture where Jesus said, I came that they might have life and that more abundantly in John 10.10. 10. And the part of the Lord's Prayer where we see that the ideal prayer includes, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6.10 Nearly every revelation involves a connection between two scriptures. This connection is supported by other scriptures. There are billions of such interconnections contained in God's word, ones that set us free to walk as they walk in heaven, to minister as Jesus ministered, to walk in the faith, to command mountains to move, etc. The church has barely scratched the surface of what he wants to reveal to us. Very little of what is currently being taught goes beyond what Paul referred to as milk. He wants us to begin to eat meat from his table. To all who want to eat meat, just ask him to increase the operation of the spirit of wisdom and revelation in your life, and he will. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Romans 10.11 Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The Greek word for shame here does not mean embarrassed. It means not disappointed. So the above verse is more accurately translated, Anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. We often forget that Jesus became a man, a man without sin, but still a man. He had a perfect relationship with God, but he had to grow spiritually and physically just like we do. He had to learn to stand on God's promises in the word, just like we do. He had to go through the exact same development process that we have to go through so he could properly intercede for us. So when it came time for him to go to the cross, he stood on the promises his father made to him in the word. He had to do the exact same thing that we have to do during a time of testing. The word assured him that whoever trusts in God will never be disappointed, that he who promised is faithful so he knew that his father would raise him from the dead because of the verse. He would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. He went into the hardest test given to man, basing all his confidence on the promises in God's word. He had to walk by faith, not by sight, just like we do. We know this because it says without faith, it is impossible to please God. And Jesus led a life pleasing to his father. I'm going to have to cut it short here and continue on on the next video.